and program on Other Than Earth 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. This is an opinion-based program. Viewer discretion is advised. Tonight, let's talk about our economy. After a massive uprising and an unprecedented period, where an elected leader was chased out of office, Sri Lanka's economic wars continues to soldier on. Curbing wasteful spending and giving more priority to essential needs, Sri Lankans are now forced to live in a time not knowing what the future would even look like. Are we taking the proper steps and more importantly, asking the right questions to find the appropriate answer that benefits all of us? On tonight's program, we will share views from the current governor of the central bank, Dr. Nandalal Virusinghe, speak to a former governor, Ajit Nivan Kabra, and get a third-party point of view from economic journalist, Vinod Munasinghe. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Joni, and this is the State of the Nation. Hello everyone, good to see you back on the program. Thank you very much for your time. Now, if you believed that the solution for Sri Lanka's current economic crisis is the IMF, well, sad to say, you were fooled. Sri Lanka has been having a very on and off relationship with the IMF, and this lending body has always been, to quote the former finance minister of Greece, toxic. But this time the story has changed a bit and the control of the situation is now with this toxic body. Why do I say this? Suppose we are people who can't learn from mistakes that have taken place around the world in other countries like uh, Greece, South Korea, Argentina and even from a regional friend like Pakistan for this same economic problem. Well in that case we are as a society a bunch of A-grade fools. The Greek finance minister who was on the show uh, last week was very specific stating that Sri Lanka doesn't fall for these flowery feel-good words from a lending agency that has a track record of destroying developing countries. Here's the former Greece finance minister Yanis Varoufakis. Listen in. I really simply refuse to believe that anybody body thought that we could repay the loans that the IMF and the European Central Bank and the European Union gave us supposedly to save us. I don't think that anybody was idiotic enough to believe that it was possible to repay those loans under conditions of fiscal austerity. So the question is, why did they do it? Well, the answer is all around me here in Greece today. Let me give you an example. 14 of our most lucrative and profitable airports, including the airport in the island of Mykonos, the island of Sardorini. You know, these are very rich islands in terms of international tourism. Um, you know, a, a room uh, for the night in Mykonos costs more than a thousand dollars, more than a thousand dollars, even the cheapest room. So you imagine what kind of earning capacity the airport of Mykonos has. Huh? Those 14 airport, airports were given for free to foreign interests, to a German company, for free, just take them. So here is the answer as to how could they possibly not know that by imposing severe austerity upon us and not agreeing to a debt restructure, a rational debt restructure, didn't they know that they wouldn't get their money back? Now, if you were a regular viewer of this show very recently, and of course back in April, you would know I am advocating this country against pinning all hopes on the IMF. Why do I say this? Because it's easy to learn from the plethora of examples worldwide. Some I even mentioned a short while ago. Sri Lanka's global image as a nation that honors its debt is now long gone. 
you have been told by liberal economists in Colombo, and think tanks, that it's not essential and that they also told uh, you that what's important is to take that money and focus it elsewhere. After 80 years of independence under the current governor's leadership, who was brought in, mind you, to avert this very situation, Sri Lanka defaulted. In simple terms, Sri Lanka told the world, we ain't gonna pay a dime. Was it ever a good idea to go for a sovereign default? What leads to a country's debt crisis? A question that we need uh, real credible answers. Many reasons can lead to that. But basically, any sovereign country has only two options. One, manage the minimum priority debt repayments, which would still allow access to borrowing from international markets, which of course comes at the cost of drastically uh, channeling most of the current account uh, to debt repayment and away from essential imports. The second option, declare a sovereign debt default, which is precisely the path the previous government under, under former President uh, Gotabi Rajpaksa, upon the advice of then Finance Minister Ali Sabri and the current governor of the Central Bank, Dr. Namdalal Virasinghe, opted to do. Initially, they misdirected us, saying we didn't default, we only soft default. Later, we found out that was a blatant lie. There is nothing called soft default. Sri Lanka indeed has defaulted. And in the eyes of the world, we are a pariah state. Now, what are the implications when you default on your sovereign debt? That means no one is going to lend you anything else, no money from anywhere else. If someone is actually uh, giving us any kind of money, now that will always come with an unfathomable rules, regulations, and conditions that are never favorable to us. Meaning, it'll always be favorable to the creditor. So you've excluded from international financial markets, and at that point, you have to do anything to save your reputation. Now, we see imports uh, dropping altogether. Exports may spike up. That corresponds to a positive increase in the current account, which means that resources flow out of this country. This is observed to go together with the output drop, indicating that your GDP is going down simultaneously. So sovereign debt crises come together with spikes in exports or capital flow reversals, which are called sudden stops. Then output drops along with the GDP. And consumption drops essentially as well. These are the features that, are, that we are ob observing right now within our economy. Within the Colombo liberal economic circles, defaulting was something that was entertained. Several former ministers, along with several left-leaning think tanks, entertained this idea of defaulting and then taking that money and uh, addressing essential needs of the country, which is precisely what is done right now. These same individuals who are now pretending to know all things economic first told us that floating the rupee would bring in so many dollars into the country. That didn't happen. The said uh, individuals said that many investors would come running, but that didn't happen either. Now they say that the IMF is the best way forward. Lessons across the world dictates that will be another bold-faced lie. So back in April, as reported by this program, these individuals managed to create a bus towards defaulting. But that agenda completely ignored the fact that about 16% out of the total international sovereign bonds outstanding in January of uh, 2022 this year, uh, which is around 13 billion US dollars, is reportedly being held mainly by Sri Lankan banks and other investors, and that, the, that a default by the government of these ISBs would lead to the severe destabilization of the entire Sri Lankan banking system. And that is something we will witness in, uh, in months to come. In, if we do not take any kind of uh, action to correct this. So the question is, was Sri Lanka bankrupt before or after April 12th? By setting, uh, settling the ISB repayment of uh, 500 million US dollars in January, Sri Lanka averted bankruptcy by settling that. Back in um, the beginning of the year, it seems like uh, those who had advised the government to default 
was clueless that repayment exercise is dependent not just upon the quantum of the available funds in hand, but on the funds inflows and outflows, as well as the rollover of debt, which is dependent upon public confidence. The federal government is borrowing money at an astonishing rate. However, the interest rate is lower than the rate of economic growth. If that lasts, it's possible that the government can just roll over its debt, borrowing new money to pay interest on the old money. Debt will grow forever, but the economy will grow faster, so debt will fall relative to the size of the economy. Proponents of government spending cite this possibility as a justification for borrowing even more, and mostly to send money to people and businesses. Borrowing money, sending it to people, and never raising taxes to repay it is catnip to politicians' ears. And if the government doesn't have to pay back its debts, why should any citizens have to pay back our debts? Borrow and bail us out too. Why should we work? Will it work? Or will big borrowing have to be followed by big taxes and big spending cuts if we're to avoid a big inflation, or worse, a really big debt crisis? The interest rate versus growth rate question is a fascinating technical debate for economic theorists. Now, therefore, it is vital that the authorities ensure public confidence in the financial system and carefully arrange the cash flows. If the only criteria for debt repayment were the availability of liquid funds in possession, it would have been impossible to manage the debt repayment programs of the government over the past years. The decision to default announcement of uh, April 12th of this year may have completely disrupted expected inflows, while the non-payment of July 2022, 1,000 million US dollar ISB led to a cross default fallout as well. Most governments uh, go to great lengths to avoid default, even if all signs point to an unsustainable public debt trajectory. But why do countries perceive default as such a dirty word? The reason, according to uh, most, is that the cost of sovereign default far outweigh the benefits in terms of lower debt burden, a matter that uh, the current governor has completely gambled upon. I will be right back. Welcome back everyone. This is the State of the Nation. I wanted to speak to the current governor of the Central Bank, Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe, and ask him why defaulting debt was necessary. Sadly, the governor's office informed us that he's not available for an interview with this program. I might think for obvious reasons. Perhaps the governor is not comfortable answering a few questions about why the first ever default occurred under his leadership. We tried our level best to explain to the governor and his staff why it's vital he answers these questions and be transparent with the Sri Lankan people, something he said the previous administration was not doing. However, his secretary verbally informed us that he could not explain his decision to this program due to his busy schedule. Fortunately, the governor has answered this question in other public forums. Listen in. Santita Hatha is a billion to Una, you ran over the Mambaragan out of April Massey, Pach can put a Santa million with Saiti. Already, central bank and government both banks in Saiti had already defaulted, even before we announced the death sense. It massacre calling her a six month roadmap Kilaka Kanaska, a matter here calling it Vatabatuma, you go billion the Hakinaki Lilang Massaid, April Massa Manganoka, Windu Latib, Sadaka Tavilatna, Tin Santika Bindu Hill. When Karan de Gudna, at the time, Apsaka Chakala, Alumda Lekam Tanti Katakala, with the Eric Mudan Katakala, Cabinet Take Approval, Apitik Nagata, make Metering Hat and I give you Kramyagna. Abit Nagan Pulang, not about a given back. Mugatis Salina. 
Well, we can argue that the formula supplied by this current central bank and the finance ministry would be the way forward and must be the sentiment that need to be followed. The proof of the pudding will be uh, when we all, as Sri Lankans, can go and enjoy life without any restrictions. Now, that's yet to come. The current governor, however, believes this is the way forward. All the difficult measures have already been implemented. But we can see the result of all difficult measures uh, will ease the situation, will stabilize the economy. And once it stabilizes the economy from next year, knows that is the path of recovery. This is why we need to continue moving in this direction without turning back. And we, all policymakers, including the government and the central bank, should ensure the measures that we have taken, the policies we have committed, will continue to be implementing and move in the same direction. Now, in this story of Sri Lanka defaulting and uh, the economic crisis, there's an individual who was vilified by the radical liberals and the left-leaning economists, stating that his decisions and policies are the reason we are in this crisis. Well, I want to get his side of the story because this is a program that respects all views and points. And for that, I'm now joined by the former governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nimad Kabra. Former governor, thank you very much uh, for your time. Now, according to the so-called liberal economic pundits, you single-handedly destroyed Sri Lanka's economy. How come you managed to do something like that? I think that's why I did a book which is titled Arthika Ghatak and Mather, which means amidst the economic hitmen. And I did that specifically in order to explain what really happened in Sri Lanka's situation. What were the causes? What caused this country's economy to be vulnerable? How did it become vulnerable? Then what were the steps that were very clearly taken by several people? several persons who appeared to be a little not connected but actually were connected what really happened and how they went about that work in order to a make sri lanka bankrupt and b ensure that sri lanka will have a situation where they cannot fend for themselves and have to rely on other people so very clearly i'm leaving it to the people who want to read it as well as understand what really took place so that they can understand who is actually responsible. I know there are some people who accuse me and I did that, mainly, I, I waited patiently for about eight months in order to let the situation take its course so that nobody can point a finger at me and say, here, he's the, he's the guy who did this and he disrupted what was being, take, buying, being done as well. That's why I kept quiet so that people can for themselves decide what really was taking place and today they can see the new path that has been traversed by these people with whose advice has been taken where they are going i can also tell you that these people who are making these allegations they never take responsibility for their advice that they have given as well what has happened is today they have slowly slunk away those who had advocated default those who advocated for the interest rates to be increased, those who advocated for the IMF to come in. Today, they are not as vociferous as they were earlier. Today, they are silent, in fact. They are now slowly leaving the burden on other people and pointing fingers at others so that they can escape from the liability of the decisions that they have prompted. And that's the reality of this country. And I think that will be found out soon. And then soon, people will know who has been responsible actually for this situation. Indeed. Uh, now, uh, former governor, you were a very ardent advocate uh, against Sri Lanka going to the IMF. Uh, when you were the governor, you initially said never to the IMF, but later you had to change that tune. Now, last week, uh, former Greece finance minister Yanis Varoufakis was on this program and he too gave a detailed description of how IMF uh, would be Sri Lanka's potential destroyer. Do you still believe that the IMF is the wrong choice for Sri Lanka? I believe that I believe so because if you have looked at what we did in the brief period that I was the governor, we were able to raise about $3,800 million from bilateral sources and that kept our economy steady during that period. 
We also had another massive pipeline of inflows of $10,700 million, all that I have mentioned in my book as well. Now that's about a $14,700 million, which was possible for us to receive. Some had already come, some were on the verge of coming. Now this deal that we are talking about with the IMF is for $2.9 billion, spread over four years. That means about $750 million per annum. If so, for half a year, it would have been $375 million. Now, had I been to the IMF at the time, on my first day itself in office, and we were successful in getting that money in the, on the second day, we would have got a maximum of $375 million, and we would have had to do all what is being done today, raising interest rates, floating the rupee, selling off our assets, uh, and doing so many other things which now will come to light after a little while, you will find that we would have had to do all that. And for all for $375 million for every six months. At the same time today, we are not receiving any money from anyone, other, anyone else as well. So that would have been the plight that we would have been in. And, and at that stage, everybody would have asked, why did they go for the, to the IMF for the 17th time? They would have asked that question and that quite rightly so. So we didn't go at that time, and now people said that is the best choice, and they went. Now let's see. I, I hope that for the sake of the country that it will be successful, but I have this feeling like what the Greek uh, finance minister has very, very, very well articulated. He has said, IMF is not a bit of medicine. It is a toxic drug. So whether it becomes a toxic drug or not, I hope it doesn't happen to Sri Lanka, but I have this feeling that it is what is going to happen, and that's why you've got to search for other options. You mustn't say IMF is the, is the only option, and then embrace IMF and hope that all the problems will be solved, and that would be the panacea for all Sri Lanka ills. So please search for options. I am very clear about this. Please search for other options as well, and have those ready, because the moment you find that it is not going your way, and IMF is not going to deliver the goods, have another side opened out so that you will have that also for Sri Lanka to emerge from. And I do hope that the authorities will listen to that and take that course of action as well. Absolutely. Uh, now, former governor, uh, what do you think Sri Lanka needs to do right now and not doing? Homegrown solutions uh, were something that you were strongly pushing for. Is that still the way forward? I think it is the way forward, because if you don't have homegrown solutions which are peculiar to Sri Lanka, I don't think this is going to work. You must have people with a Sri Lanka's interest at heart to be taking those decisions and taking that path. Now, we don't know who the IMF guys who are doing it from Washington. You are not going to be able to question uh, uh, those guys at any time. We are talking about them, but nobody knows who they are. You can at least catch hold of the governor here or the finance minister who is here and then question them. But you are never going to be able to question the people who have taken those decisions. When you were talking to the Greece, Greece's finance minister, you, he has to defend or he has to talk about decisions that have been taken in Washington over which he had no control. But finally what happened? The country that has to pay for the price is the country that had to suffer through those decisions. And there is nobody responsible either. So if we are willing to embrace the decisions as well as the prescription that has been given to us from elsewhere, and we find that is more attractive than the own prescription that we can have, I think we are barking up the wrong tree. And I hope that Sri Lanka won't have to suffer through that fate because this is our country. We don't have any other country, and we hope that uh, there will be SENA Council also that will make Sri Lanka search for other options, and that is vital if you are to get out of this situation. Absolutely. Uh, former Governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nivad Kabra, thank you very much for your time. We'll be back in a moment.
Welcome back everyone uh, to the State of the Nation. Uh, to understand this economic crisis in Sri Lanka and whether we are applying solutions that would help us get out of this issue, I wanted to get a third party opinion. For that, uh, I'm now joined by uh, economic journalist Vinod Munasinghe. Vinod, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. Vinod is also the uh, former chair of uh, the Ceylon German Technical Training Institute, an institute uh, that shapes young minds with skills needed for the job market. Vinod, thank you very much for joining me. Um, what is your view on uh, our economy right now? Is the part the central bank and the current government have taken the fix we need? Mahesh, I do not think that the way that we are going now is going to solve our basic problems. We have to, we have two problems to overcome at the moment. One is the indebtedness that we have got into in the past period. And the second one is to dig ourselves out of an economic hole, which we have been digging ourselves into for the last 50 years. We do not produce as much as we import. We do not export as much as we import. There is a huge gap there. That's one of the major problems which we have to deal with. The second problem is dealing with uh, illegal transfers overseas. Some of them are legal, and but uh, the vast bulk are illegal through uh, misinvoicing and through uh, undial uh, or hawala. These two account for, I think, uh, about ten billion dollars a year, which is uh, more than our, which is about equal to our trade deficit every year. Until we deal with these problems, we will not be able to go forward. Absolutely, uh, we know now. You formerly head, headed an institution uh, that is shaping many young minds with skills needed for the job market. The current crisis will heavily impact them. How do you look at the whole issue uh, with regard to the future of the youth? Actually, it doesn't look good from the point of view of the youth. Um, uh, as it was, there were quite a few people. There were people applying. There were 4,000 people applying every year to join uh, the Ceylon German Technical Training Institute, which only had 600 places because they would be more or less assured of a place overseas. Whereas the other vocational training and technical places were not being full, full, filled. But uh, recently, there, there have been a huge demand for overseas jobs, and there are people have been paying the uh, agents, job agents to go for non existent jobs abroad because there's a feeling among the youth that they, they don't really have any future here. And that is very dangerous. So we have to build a future for these youth. We have to be able to uh, send them, some of them overseas because we need to earn the foreign exchange. But at the same time, we should be developing our own industries so that we can give them jobs. There are whole areas that we, we have left uh, open. For example, in logistics, we, we have been talking for years and years about logistics, but we really haven't progressed uh, beyond the Stone Age, more or less, because uh, we are uh, going to the modern, modern era and except for one or two companies, most of them are not in the modern era. They are tinkering around on the edges and uh, we are not, Getting into the mainstream, we, we, we should be, say, for example, on the Belt and Road, we should be exporting to China, importing from China and re-exporting, but we are not doing any of that. Uh, we have to think in terms of expanding these things uh, scientifically. We have to uh, see what our faults are, what where our strengths are, and utilize those to go forward. And we are not, I do not think that we are doing that. We do not have a proper plan in place. It's merely tinkering within a, a framework, a financial framework, which is not, or that's not the be all and end all of uh, economic development. In fact, our economy has developed from through importing. We are not adding value actually. We, we are extracting value. We are make, taking super profits by importing from overseas and selling it to our people at greater cost. We have some of one of the highest uh, costs uh, costs of living in the in the region, and this is because of this uh, wonky uh, uh, trade pattern. So we have to get out of that, and we have to. If our youth are going to have any future, they have to be able to see that they have got a future. That's the first thing which they don't feel they have. 
Uh, we know very quickly we are running out of time. What do you think about the IMF? Is it a good fit for Sri Lanka? No, I do not think so. We have been to the IMF. I think this is the 17th time we are going to the IMF. We have been making structural adjustments, uh, changing the way that we do business, all this kind of thing for years, for 50 years we've been doing it and uh, it hasn't hit. Uh, we haven't really progressed beyond the level that we were in 19, say 1960 in terms of developing our industries, in terms of developing the other areas uh, in comparison with the rest of the world, I mean. So uh, we are still a backward country after 50 years of IMF advice. What we should be doing is going to our friendly uh, nation, to allied nations. We can go to India, to China, Iran, and give them a plan for getting out of this uh, fix. Get them to fund us to get out of this fix. But we have to have a coherent and believable plan. It's no point having pipe dreams about uh, development, which we are, I mean, that's where the way we have been going all these years. We are, a, uh, tomorrow we, we shall be a nation. We have not, we can't carry on like that. We have to have a definite plan to get out of this. And we have to have the government steering the economy in such a way that we can get out of this rut. And that is not happening. True, true, absolutely. Um, we have to leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Vinod Munasinghe, former chair of Ceylon German Technical Training Institute and also uh, an economic journalist. Thank you very much. Now, the current ongoing reforms are centered upon monetary policy and fiscal side only regarding spending. But there needs to be more connection between the current policies and creating a, a conducive environment for small and medium enterprises, which consists of around 60 to 70 percent of our economy. Now, what reforms do we have to monetize our physical and human resources? New ideas are floating, like taking necessary measures to boost government and private sector revenue generation, to focus on the production of it locally and not purely on getting it done by someone else abroad. There are plenty of new ideas that focuses from the point of Sri Lanka and putting you and me first. Those ideas needs to be brought into the foray and given more prominence than the ones that is heavily discussed right now, which will result in this nation being a beggar's nation for many more years to come. Well, that's all the time we have for you uh, on this episode of State of the Nation. If you missed uh, tonight's program, you will visit our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. Also, make sure you check out our podcast, which came out last week in the podcast. I'm joined by my uh, good colleague, Danidhi Dhanamasam, and we discuss very openly about speed, uh, freedom of speech. Thank you for watching. I'm Mahesh Johnny. Good night.